Uh, welcome to the 3.30 class. Um, I am uh, talking for uh, three days on the church in the secular age. Uh, today, sex. Uh, tomorrow, violence. And Friday, rock and roll. Uh, the things that define the secular age. Um, I will be saying all I know about each topic, so today's will be short. <laughs> you will get out of class rather early, um, probably. Um, well, uh, those of you who've been uh, coming in for, here for a while, we're going to do what we do. That is, I'm going to try to listen very carefully to some texts. And uh, we're, going to do, we're going to do theology, because that's what we do. And uh, undoubtedly you have come in with some very specific questions that you want answers to. And if you've been with me for a while, you know there is no way that's going to happen. <laughs> um, but, but hopefully uh, I will raise ways to ask the questions in a more creative way, because getting the question right is half the, half the project, right? And... Again, if you've been uh, with me for a while, you know I am a fierce believer in congregationalism. Uh, that is, I don't think college professors ought to solve the problems of your local congregation for you. I think you ought to do that. And uh, I'll, I'll offer an opinion on uh, some things to be sure, and others I won't. And I'll offer some opinions that by the time I'm done, you won't be clear what it was I was... Uh, <laughs> I was suggesting. Um, <clears throat> this is not going to be a heavily footnoted lecture. Um, I, I have, in um, the last year, gotten, for a variety of reasons, very interested in Christian sexual ethics. Uh, and what I do when I get interested in something is I start reading. And uh, there will be a couple of places where I'll directly refer you to a, a particular work. But if you hear something, if, you're, if you've been researching this and you hear something that's probably sounds a little familiar to you, it's probably because we read the same thing. And nobody wants to hear a series of footnotes, so I'm going to try not to steal shamelessly. But there, there are a lot of people's works who are sort of in the background of uh, what I am going to uh, argue. Um, so let me uh, present you with uh, two different points of view, and then we'll start to listen to some texts on sex. Um, the church, point of view number one. The church has been absolutely obsessed with sex. The church started to be obsessed with sex somewhere about the time of St. Augustine. Uh, who died in 430. I don't know what time it was, but the year was 430. <laughs> I always tell my students that's one of the very few years it's actually worth remembering. Augustine dies in 430 and the lights go out in Europe for the next thousand years. And uh, Augustine, uh, for a good while, put off Christian baptism. Uh, his mother uh, was a Christian. By the way, her name was uh, Monica, Saint, Santa Monica, is named after Augustine's mother, if you didn't know that. Aren't you glad you came? Uh, <clears throat> see, this is more relevant than you thought it was going to be. Uh, uh, so, so his mother, who, who was a Christian, was really quite annoyed by this, and Augustine went through a, a considerable spiritual intellectual journey, including uh, hanging out with some really... I feel like sort of kooky groups uh, called the Manichees. But when he finally came around to accepting Christian baptism, he believed that he must be done with two things. Number one was vainglory, because he was a brilliant rhetorician, had the possibility of having this great career, and he thought that if he was going to take seriously being a servant of Christ, he had to give up that ambition. And the second one was, of course, sex. Uh, he had a mistress, he had an illegitimate child whom he loved, 
And um, he felt like before he took on Christian baptism, he needed to know that he was done with sex. And so you get this line often attributed to Augustine, God, give me chastity, just not yet. Um, and Augustine, because of his philosophical background, made a rather close connection between um, sex and sin. Uh, he had a, a, a kind of low view of embodiment. And the body was kind of one of those things you had to keep under control. And so, you know, he believes, Genesis 1, that God created us and said it was good. But, uh, you know, sin and sex, those are kissing cousins. Uh, that was better on paper. Uh, <laughs> For those of you of a certain age, that's called the Johnny Carson effect. You know, he reached his true greatness as a comedian when he stopped telling good jokes, right? And then he would make fun of himself for telling bad, bad jokes. So I'm entering that phase of my, uh, <laughs> of, of my life. And er, ever since then, um, at least since then, the church has been obsessed with sex. And we're concerned about who's sleeping with whom, and whether they're married or not. And in fact, that problem, which was always bad in the 60s, got much worse. Uh, this, I would take, as a cultural fact. Uh, in the 60s, uh, I'm, I'm sure in the 50s people were having sex, but in the 60s everybody was having it with everybody. And there was this feeling of liberty that was partly, uh, partly contributed by um, the creation of dependable contraception, uh, which actually had an enormous impact on sexual ethics. And then the church became essentially defined by it being opposed to the sinful sexual ethics of the 60s. The church became defined as the people who were against. And large portions of the church have continued to sort of occupy that position. That is, they define sin primarily by things that happen below the waist. The church is obsessed with it. Um, and with, with uh, you know, you can go two ways with this. Here comes the two point of views. On the one side, you would have the folks that say, with genocide and terrorism and abuse and poverty and inequality of wealth, you're really going to worry about whether people are sleeping together before they get married? Get a grip on reality. And on the other side, you're going to have people who say it is because the church has never really planted its feet and taken a solid stance that people could respect that we're in the mess we're in and the Supreme Court decision on homosexual marriage proves it. So you can have some people who say the great calling of the kingdom to God today is social justice. And you'll have other people who say the great calling of the kingdom of God today is to go back and get our sexual ethic right. Okay, which of those is right? Okay, my students know what to say at this point. <laughs> Whenever Harris asks a question like that, the answer is... Yes, yes, which is right, yes, yes. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, show you that uh, Paul particularly is very concerned with sexual ethics and uh, see if I can say uh, why. And then I'm going to come back and talk about... Uh, the kind of question I just laid out. Okay, so uh, let's, let's read uh, some text. 
Uh, let's see. We're going to talk about sex. Where should we start? How about Genesis 1? Um, there are very few good stories that don't start in Genesis 1. Um, and I, I just want to draw your attention to 1.26. Then God said, let us make uh, humans in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So he created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, on, over every living creature that moves on the ground. Uh, okay, that's one of those passages that we read so often, it's pretty easy to not really pay attention. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to a, a couple of different writers who kind of made me look at this. He said to them, Be fruitful and increase. In number, fill the earth, and subdue it. Okay, if you take that text at more or less face value, what is the primary function of sex there? Procreation. Okay, that's not a creative reading of the text. That's reading words on the page, right? Okay, and the reason he wants to create the male and female and call them together for sex is so that they will be fruitful and multiply to subdue the earth. And it really is hard to subdue the earth when there's only two of you. <laughs> Spread out. <laughs> so in, in this sort of original passage, Sex is very tightly tied to procreation, which is tied to the human mandate to exercise dominion over the earth. Okay, um, not much to that, right? Okay, now uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Uh, we'll go through Jesus to get to Paul. Um, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea, to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he heard them there. He healed them there. You may have heard them too, but it, what, he, it, what the text says is he healed them. Okay. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you heard, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one, therefore what God has joined together let man not separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. Um, that's a very uh, interesting uh, passage, but as it turns out, this is not going to be a lecture on uh, marriage and divorce. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. <laughs> oh, i got to pause on that one for a minute. I mean, when you stop and think about it, it's sort of an arresting statement. They have such a low view of human nature and marriage that they think the chances of leaving in faithful covenant with one person are so low that you probably, if that's the only way you can do it, you shouldn't do it. Really? Jesus replied, Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. 
For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Hmm. Okay, there is a preference expressed there for singleness, right? I don't, I don't think I'm reading that into the text. It's sort of right there. But there's this very realistic evaluation from Jesus that um, mm, not everybody's going to be able to do that. Okay, now... Uh, Turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians 7. We're actually going to wind up spending more time in 1 Corinthians 6, but uh, I'm going to start in 7 and work backwards. <clears throat> now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. Or to put it another way, it's good for a man not to marry. I just wanted to read that twice. <laughs> okay, but get this. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. He's talking about sex. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other, talking about sex, except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am. That is, single. <laughs> but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Okay. By pure observation, in this text, we are a far piece now from Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Now we have marriage that's the primary function of which is not procreation. The primary function of it is the channeling of sexual energy. That if you have the ability of self-control, then it's better than if you be single. But if you don't, and there is so much immorality in the world that everybody should have their own spouse. So we just don't have sex going on everywhere. Paul's view. Now, one of the things I sort of wonder is, okay, how do we get from one place to the other? In Genesis 1, sex seems to be primarily about procreation. Uh, in Matthew 19 and 1 Corinthians 7, now uh, marriage seems to be not so much about procreation as it does the proper channeling of sex. And there is a preferential option in both Jesus and Paul. Uh, by the way, it makes it a good bit clearer a little later. Um, uh, those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. Verse 32, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. Yes, we are. <laughs> but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. Yes, we are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I have done this bunches of times, and there's always somebody who says that. <laughs> yeah, at least you better be, right? <laughs> and his interests are divided. 
An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Uh, Paul prefers singleness. Uh, Jesus appears to. Uh, but both seem to have an understanding that not everybody has this gift, and they both have high views of, of, of sex, and that the proper channeling of that energy is into marriage, not just indiscriminate sexuality. Uh, but I, I, I just, I'm going to offer a theory on why we have the shift from uh, Genesis 1 uh, to 1 Corinthians 7. And this is the sort of theory you shouldn't just accept at face value, nor should you discard it. What you should do is think about it. Um, when Jesus comes and proclaims that the kingdom of God has come near, and when Paul writes under the shadow of that promise, um, I cannot fully argue the case at the moment, but I would argue the case that Paul believes the eschaton is imminent. I think he would be shocked to find out we're all still here. <laughs> I think he thought it was coming within a generation. Okay, if you believe that, if you believe that the coming of the kingdom has burst into the world and it's near and we're living in the last days, procreation becomes totally unimportant. What's important is devotion to God, the living into and the heartening of the kingdom. Uh, but even in that, mm, sex, that's a difficult one. And so Paul says, even though the kingdom has come near, and it would be great if everybody could live in undivided devotion to God, many people, most people, by my reckoning, are not wired that way, so everyone should have their own husband and wife. And not only that, one of the primary reasons they should is so that sex can have its proper outlet. Um, when I read this uh, passage to my freshmen and, and say, Paul insists that husbands and wives must have sex. It's not an option. Their reaction is finally a command I can get behind. <laughs> That's the first thing you've said the whole semester that I can be fully, you know, kind of on board uh, with. And so Paul has this... Um, uh, I, don't, I don't think he has a low view of marriage. I, I don't think single or married have anything to do with spiritual inferiority or superiority. Uh, I think it has to do with ministry. And there's also some sort of impending distress in 1 Corinthians. I will leave it to you to decide whether that's the end of the world or something else going on that we're just not aware of. Okay, now, with that as a backdrop, I want to come back to 1 Corinthians 6, where uh, Paul speaks uh, in a much more straightforward way about my topic, uh, which is uh, sex. Um, so, kind of, kind of what I'm uh, arguing here... Uh, um, one of the reasons that the question of sexual ethics has become a pressing problem is uh, the question of uh, homosexual unions. And if you think that's unbiblical, uh, I would advise you to pick some argument other than the non-procreative argument because procreation doesn't seem to be the point for either Jesus or Paul. It was when he said, in Genesis 1, to exercise uh, dominion, be fruitful, multiply. You can't exercise dominion unless you do that. 
But that doesn't seem to be the primary argument in either Matthew 19 or in uh, 1 Corinthians 7. So if I were going to make an argument, I'd want to make a different kind of uh, argument. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, beginning with verse uh, 12. Everything is permissible for me. Okay, let me pause there. No, no. Uh, Paul doesn't mean that. Uh, he, he actually doesn't mean that. Okay, there are, uh, there are um, three categories of, 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 of actions or behaviors in Paul's ethic. Uh, there are the things that are wrong. Uh, everything is permissible. Actually, no. Acts murdering babies? Nope, you're out. Not everything is permissible. There are the things that are wrong. Uh, there are the things that are right. And then there's this broad group of things in the middle that are morally neutral. Like eating meat offered to idols. Okay, so he, he's, got, he's got a group of things that he thinks is wrong. He's got a group of things that he thinks is right, and he's also got this group of things which uh, he thinks are morally neutral. And how do you figure out what you do in situations where the things are morally neutral? Oh, you thought that was rhetorical. Okay. <laughs> what you do on the things that are morally neutral, like eating meat offered to idols, is you see how your behavior is going to impact the community of which you are a part. Um, and by the way, if you like that, you do not understand it. Uh, you mean there's going to be limitations placed on my freedom because of your hang-ups? Turns out, yes. I have, to, I have to think about how my actions are going to impact uh, other people. Paul's quite clear about that, but that's not the text I'm particularly teaching at the moment. Okay. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality... But for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By His power God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. Do you know, not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. Hmm. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Shun sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Okay, I want to pay close attention to what I think is uh, the argument here. Um, you have uh, different kinds of people coming into the kingdom of God. Uh, and primarily, uh, the categories... In the New Testament, uh, uh, in the earliest church, is you have Jews coming into the kingdom of God and you have Gentiles coming into the kingdom of God. Those are the two broad categories. Um, Paul sometimes raises questions about those categories. That is, in the book of Romans, he writes a whole book to raise questions about the category of Jew-Gentile. He says, wrong categories, right categories are Adam Christ, not Jew-Gentile. Spends a whole book making that argument complicated argument. Um, but I'm not doing that today. Uh, but in, in this case, okay, we have, we have Jews who are coming into the kingdom of God, and we have Gentiles who are coming into the kingdom of God. For a Jew who's coming into the Christian church, mm, what's the biggest problem? Okay, in the old days we might say something like legalism, right? 
Um, you know, I don't, I don't talk about legalism in my classes much anymore. You could drop a bomb on my classes and no legalist would be killed. Uh, uh, you know, I wish. Uh, uh, you, may, you, 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 you do have quish, questions of Christian identity. The, the place you see that most fully played out in the book is in the book of Galatians. Uh, that is what identifies one as a member of the people of God. And Paul argues strongly that what identifies one as one of God's people is the confession that Jesus is Lord. And those other identity markers that uh, some Jewish Christians want to apply to everybody, uh, Paul is going to have none of that. And in fact, in Galatians, he's got himself worked up into a pretty good heat about the whole thing. Uh, you know, if anybody preaches any gospel other than the one that we've preached, let them be accursed. If you didn't hear it the first time, let me say it again. Let them be accursed, which means let them be eternally damned. Go to hell forever. <laughs> if they're going to teach circumcision, I wish they'd just keep on cutting. <laughs> That's what he says. <laughs> Read Galatians, that's, that's pretty worked up. Right. So, when Jews come into the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ, there are some questions about what the identity markers are. When Gentiles come into the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, the primary problem is ethics. And one of the primary spheres of ethics is sexual ethics. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that every pagan in uh, the day of Paul was sexually immoral. What I'm suggesting is most were. <laughs> and I mean it. Food for the body, the body for food. To the typical pagan in Paul's day, eating and sex would be essentially in the same category. It's stuff the body does. And having sex with a prostitute or a slave, male or female, has no more significance than eating a good meal. By the way, Read the book of Philemon sometime, and I, you know, Scott McKnight got me thinking about this, and think about the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus before they were Christians, and think about that, you know, he might be sending Onesimus back to a guy who raped him. Now read the book. Let's see what you think. So Paul comes into this pagan world where sex and eating are essentially the same thing, and he says, okay, when you're a Christian, it doesn't work that way anymore. And he, he makes a, a series of riveting theological arguments. Uh, one of those arguments is you are bought with a price. Uh, that is, it's very similar to the sort of thing that Paul says in Romans chapter 6, somebody is going to own you. And you have become a slave of righteousness. Or in this case, Jesus Christ owns you. You no longer belong to yourself. So, Paul argues. And that's a pretty powerful argument. Uh, he argues that you are uh, a, a dwelling place for God's spirit. Okay. Um, I'll do this uh, little quick thing. This will be kind of a drive-by thing. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to look at the atoning work of, of Jesus Christ, but at least one interesting way to look at it is this. Okay, uh, 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 Jesus is partaking in the Old Testament sacrificial system, and what Jesus is doing in his death is he is becoming the sacrifice that makes you 
a fit dwelling place for God. So in the Old Testament, a sacrifice had to be made to cleanse the sanctuary before you could do anything else. Guess what? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ has cleansed the sanctuary, which is you, and you are now a fit dwelling place for God, and His Spirit has come to dwell in you. You want to take God to the prostitute with you? And then he makes this argument. It seems to me, well, I'm not 100% sure about it, is you are members of the body of Christ. And he uses this language in some other places. And Paul has this very strong view of, of community. And you can read the passage over a few times and see if you buy it or not. But I think he comes very close to saying is when you go to see a prostitute, you take the whole church with you. I think he comes very close to saying that. God dwells in you. Jesus bought you with a price. You are members of this bigger community of faith. And that becomes the things that now control your sexual ethic. Something like that, I think, is what Paul is arguing. Uh, well, okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I would say that, that Christian ethics are bound to be Strong on the notion of covenant. Uh, that, that is, there's this uh, language that, okay, leave father and mother, you cling to, you cling to your spouse. Um, scripture takes covenant very seriously. Uh, and sex seems to be part of the covenantal relationship. Uh, and sex must uh, not only be uh, covenantal, but it must uh, reflect uh, the values of the Christian community and the values of God who dwells in you and the values of the crucified Messiah who owns you. Now, uh, I, I hear the following case uh, argued uh, pretty often, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to it. I just don't want to over-argue it. Uh, Paul's instructions and Jesus' instruction and the biblical ethic can certainly be seen as restrictive. And there are ways in which it is uh, restricted. But I do want to point out that whether you see it as restrictive or liberating depends a little bit on which end of the telescope you're looking through. Um, so those of you who know me well know I'm now echoing one of my intellectual heroes, Michel Foucault, sex is never far away from power. And in the Greco-Roman world, of which Paul's a part, when it comes to sex, men have most of the power. Women don't have much, slaves don't have any. And what may seem restrictive to one might seem liberating to others. Um, you know, you can do your own sort of cultural analysis. Um, you know, I don't uh, want to be identified in terms of my Christian identity as uh, one whose, whose only identity is to be able to say what kind of sex is wrong. I would prefer not to have that identity. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I get that. Uh, but I don't think our current American sexual ethics worked out very well. I'm just offering an opinion. I just don't think it's worked out very well. And I live my life among 18 to 22 year olds and I'm telling you the hookup culture is not good news for anybody. It's not good news for men. It's not good news for women. And while readily admitting the restrictive nature of Christian sexual ethics, I, I guess as a Christian theologian what I want to argue is if people bought it, it'd be a better world. Uh, that if we had a greater commitment to the permanency of marriage, that we had a deeper sense of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and the community to which we have obligations, if we had stronger notions of covenant, that we'd be healthier. Uh, now, uh, the question is, on that yes question I started with at the beginning. Do I really have to choose? Uh, do I have to choose of whether I'm gonna say a Christian word into rampant capitalism and, and, and social justice and uh, abuse of power or, or whether I'm going uh, to say a strong word on Christian sexual ethics, or could I actually do both? Okay. Could I do both? And uh, we all know when you come around to doing this, boy, attitude's everything, right? And I, I mean, people, people sniff out if uh, you've appointed yourself to the sexual Gestapo and your primary task in life is to catch people doing stuff they shouldn't. They, they sniff that out. Um, and it's not the first thing I ask when people are asking me about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not. You know, let's talk about your sex life. <laughs> we wait till the second session to get to that. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I've gotten, I've gotten some... Uh, some criticism for not being as uh, I, I, the church in a secular age. I, I just want to admit the problem that it is a little different world than it was when you became uh, kind of sexually aware at 16 and then got married at 17. Than when you become sexually aware at 12 and get married at 28. Okay, that's, there's a different set of challenges there that I want to take seriously. Uh, I want to take seriously uh, the research that helps us uh, understand uh, transgender people. I want to reread carefully the text on homosexuality and see what they're doing. And I know some of you have that all figured out, and my only defense is I'm slow. <laughs> I'm working on it. I've been trying to listen to the text. I've been trying to read the books. And I, I'm not against having a, you know, a nice, clean set of answers to every question. I'm not against that. I'd like to get in on it. Uh, I, don't, I don't have that yet. I'm, I'm unclear about some of it. But whatever it's going to be, it's got to be covenantal. It's got to take seriously that God dwells in us. It has to take seriously that I don't just have responsibilities to myself, but to the community of which I'm a part. Uh, it has to take seriously that I'm owned by a crucified Messiah. And 
in that regard, sex is not very different from almost every other sin that besets the secular age, which are grounded in this, I want to have my own way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and give you peace. To Him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.